So when I first started hunting this spot right here, I could see my truck through this. That's how long it's been. All this stuff has grown up since then. And there wasn't really bedding in here. Now they're starting to bed in here too. Um, this spot is where um, I shot one of my very largest bucks about uh, close to 30 years ago, maybe 25 years ago. Uh, I actually saw it from the truck. It was bedding back in here, it was staged up in here. And uh, at that time there was um, a couple big bucks back there. Another one was in the 140s. This one was uh, in the 160s. And it would stage here and then go across the street. What's, what's unique is where that ditch is here, the other side of it, um, I don't know. You see where that dead tree is with the top missing? Mm -hmm. That's the land border. That's the private land border. And it goes on an angle to the corner of the uh, cattails over there. And that, those tall trees there are the trail that we were walking in on. That's the access trail that takes people back. So the, just this corner on this side of that trail is public. And back before Onyx, nobody really figured that out. They just <laughs> headed back, you know, knowing that it's public back there. And uh, I used to have this to myself. And uh, since then, the people that live here started doing drives in here and uh, killing a lot of stuff. But what the bucks do is they bed like in that red brush and in those tree islands. Um, and you'd see them come out of those specific islands, that red brush over there. The biggest stuff always seemed to come from like where that really tangly tree is right from there. There's trails that come and they'd meet right in this area and then uh, come out and go across the road to private and to crops and such, right? So I just learned early on that because I saw that buck that there's good spots right here and everybody else was overlooking this spot. And this is something I find a lot on these public properties is that there's pieces right next to the road that are overlooked. And especially when you get away from the area where I live, because people watch my videos around here, right? But if you start, if I travel, you know, to another state or, you know, even an hour or two west of here, I almost always find really good spots right alongside the parking lots if, there's, if it has the type of cover you need. Um, because people just don't look there. They think they have to go out further, right? So, uh... Now with the deer bedding back here and over here, a lot of times I slip in along this creek where I used to just come through the grass, right? And they would get up out of that brush, come through here, and uh, come right through here. And if you look, one thing I would look at is if you see these trees, see all the old rub stars? Yeah. Any year there's a big buck in there, these, these trees would get rubbed up because this is where they'd stage. Um, and this year all we have is a couple little small ones. Um, I think last year it was pretty tore up. But the other side of the road, there's crops and stuff that they, they want to go to. There's vast cornfields and private land. How many years did you hunt here before it started getting more people in here? Uh, that didn't happen until recently. I think uh, um, more when uh, uh, mobile hunting and uh, public land kind of blew up. Uh, prior to that, I didn't see a lot. And, and, and it's not just the people. I don't know that there's more people what I would say is they're more educated. They're smarter. It used to be everybody you ran into here, you'd look at their setups and you'd be like, oh God, this guy ain't gonna kill anything. You know, they'd be really bad setups. <clears throat> where now you're seeing people that have smart setups. They're setting up in ways where you're like, oh, this, guy, this guy's on them. He knows what he's doing. You see them where they hunt a little too often, but they're still in the right spots. So it's more of a, uh, you're finding less and less overlooked spots and less and less, uh, you know, spots that haven't had people in them. Do you find that on some of this stuff that, okay, a big deer came out of it two years in a row and it gets a lot of pressure for three to four years following and people start not having success, you see it kind of resetting back to normal or somewhat closer, people start forgetting about it a little bit more because it hadn't produced as far as they know or is that not a thing? Yes, uh, one of the spots we're gonna look at is an island that's way back in here in the cattails and that gets pressure and uh, it used to get no pressure. And every year, deer move in there and, and bed there, especially in later season. Um, and every year I hunt there. I mean, last year we picked up two giant sheds back there, one during the scouting workshop and one while I was hunting in late season. Um, but what happens is uh, guys will get back there. You gotta take a boat back there. I don't think there's anybody that walks back there the way I do. But guys will take a boat back there and they'll find it, see a lot of big sign, they'll set up and they'll hunt it so much that they burn it out and then they'll hunt it for a couple years straight because they saw a big buck or something. And then they'll just get, like, there's no deer back here anymore and they leave. 
and then it'll take about two years before it gets good again. Because these deer don't, uh, like when you're talking deer that are five or six, they ain't going to a place where they had pressure before. So they got to grow into an area that has had no pressure. You know, you know what I mean? So it's not like they just come back. They remember that. At least it, that's the way I feel about it. It's the way I think. I think they remember where they've had pressure. And what I've seen is when the pressure stops, it still takes a couple seasons for that spot to get good again. The Rome Legend buck that I shot, that one was uh, living on their property. And you'd see it over there all the time shining and stuff. And it would come over here, but at night. And I started figuring out that every year during the <coughs> rut, it had a girlfriend over in the corner, like the other side of that cornfield. And it would start bedding over there for the period of pre-rut. Mm -hmm. And one year I had an opportunity at them. The next year I went in and I killed him. And I just waited till the rubs showed up that were over there that showed that he was on that side of the road. But he would come over, he'd go through the right through the parking lot and he'd go right up the access trail. And he left scrapes and rubs right down the trail. And uh, people were seeing him. And people started hunting that right on the trail, right over the top of the trail. It was funny because uh, you'd be walking down the access road and somebody whistle at you like, you walking past me? Yeah. <laughs> Miles of stuff beyond you. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, when I shot that buck, I had to walk past, you know, um, I don't know, like eight people on the way back here. And it's not that far because of all the people hunting it. Now, there's one guy that was out in the open field out here with decoys set up and stuff. And I had to walk around him and he was mad. And it's like, he was 200 yards from that buck's bedding, but he wasn't in the game. When I got to where that buck was, I could see where the bed is, but it's in cattails and stuff. You can't see him until he stands up. I watched that buck get out of his bed and walk to me. He got out of his bed probably close to an hour before dark. And by the time I shot him, it was closing time. Holy crap. <laughs> Jesus. I told you he's a good one. How big do you think that thing is, Dave? Oh, he ain't big. <laughs> Look at the size of the body on that thing. I think he's a little wider than you think he thought he was. I'll pull his head out of there so we can take a good look at him. <laughs> He's got to be 21 inside, maybe? Yeah, I just think he's a little bit whiter than he thought. Holy crap, Dave. <laughs> Look at the mass on that thing. Yeah. So that guy 200 yards back didn't have a chance. Mm -hmm. And that's why we set up the way we set up, is because the majority of these bucks do not go far. It's not that they never do. Sometimes you set up on these bedding areas and you shoot them an hour before dark, and they would have went further. But that's how far they get every day. And if you're not setting up like they do every day, you're diminishing your odds. So you push those envelopes to get them where they move the most in daylight. So that's why I'm pushing myself to so close to these beds. You know, um, right here, those bucks when they get up are probably less than 100 yards. I'd say that's probably 80 yards, uh, just a guess, um, when they get up and move into here. And I'm still shooting them at closing time. One thing that's changed dramatically is the uh, ash trees. Now the ash trees are all dead now, as you can see, because of ash borers. And those gave the bucks cover. So the bedding was a lot better in these marshes and those trees when those ashes were alive because the leaf cover, they don't like bedding in sun. They'd get under those trees, you know what I mean? And now there's no cover. So now they're more into dogwood and stuff, which is a little different. Did you shine this buck from the road initially, or how did you know? I initially he saw was, it during daylight. Saw it on another <clears throat> hunt, or just no, driving by? Okay. Just driving around glass in the fields. I drove by and saw it in the brush here. Cool. So what are you looking for when you're looking for like overlooked space? Like what, what needs to happen, or what needs to have or be there for a 
What you really need to look at is uh, look at the property as how would everybody else hunt it? And look at what are they missing? What are they gonna walk past? And you gotta get in the mindset of where do people go and how do they hunt and how do they think? And the deer are gonna be where they're not. And it's not really that the deer are that much smarter, it's that they can smell where people walk. They can smell where you walk for, for days. They'll go through areas, they'll cross trails where you, you go through regularly and stuff, but they wanna live someplace where people don't go. But it can be right underneath people's noses. Like I said, when I was sitting here, even when I had those big bucks here, I'd have people walking up and down that trail at the same time. The deer would just watch them. You know, but here, there was no pressure. A lot of times you can see it with no, uh, no garbage and stuff, because people are slobs. Every place a lot of people hunt, you will find wrappers, you'll find bottles, you'll find cans, you'll find cut limbs, you'll find all kinds of sign that there's hunters where you can see marks in the tree where they use fire. You'll run into trail cameras everywhere. So what I'm looking for is spots where people don't go. A lot of times it's going to be by a road. A lot of times it's going to be really remote. People are getting more remote now that they're having a little more bravery because they have onyx, right? So it's more of the stuff that gets uh, forgotten about or it's stuff so dense that nobody will go through it. Um, one spot we looked at, me and Eric uh, walked uh, a few days ago. Um, we went two and a half miles from just dense, thick, nasty stuff that you had to push your way through the whole thing. And we found this incredible bed now. I don't think there's anybody else on there. But I think we have a really good chance of killing a big buck here. We're going to have hell getting it out, but that's part of the fun of it. <laughs> we want those problems. Yeah. <laughs> Is that why you say it, it would take just, I guess, regular hunters all spring to scout this versus I think they would look at every you don't stop. You're walk right. in the woods and stuff. And another thing is most hunters think deer live in the woods and they don't. Right. You don't stop. You just go yeah. back to where you're going. So I look at the terrain and, and I know from experience what terrains hold big bucks. Yeah. You'll find deer everywhere. <clears throat> but what you won't find is big bucks everywhere. And those big bucks are in specific types of terrain that we talk about all the time. Those edges, those points, those... Uh, transitions and what we'll do is we'll just walk that transition line just as if we're going out to to hunt right where those deer live and we'll find all the spots where they're bedding and coming out and then we'll th those are the places we'll focus on when we hunt it's not to say learning every inch doesn't help you but there's a lot of marshes out here and a, you, you know i'm always going to end up hunting in one of those spots so i really really want to know where the hunting spots are where i'm going to kill that deer i don't need to know every inch of the property um, when you look at people's uh, phones, that, like people show me their phones all the time and they're like, like, where should I hunt? And you look at their map and you can't even see it because there's so many points on there. Every place a deer rubbed his antlers, every place they found a trail camera. And it's like, why do you even have all that garbage on there? It's That's useless, <laughs> right? All I want to know is right where that deer that you want to hunt is, where he's living, how he's coming out, where you can kill him. So you'll only stage hunt an area once you know it's a good bedding area or there's a good buck in there, right? Or I don't really stage hunt much. Okay. What okay. I do to stage hunt isn't the, the normal term stage hunt. What I'll do is if I know there's a big buck out here, if I know one lives here, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to come in and I'm going to hunt this spot and that spot and this spot and that spot. And there's only so many bedding areas that hold big bucks and I'm going to hunt them down. And I'm going to figure out where he's at. I'm going to look at the sign when I go in and and I'm gonna see what I see. Most of the time if I hunt a spot, it's done. Then I'm moving on to the next spot. And I'll hunt like that until I either run across that buck or I burn out all the spots. Okay. If I see really good sign, I might give a spot a second shot. But usually once I've been in there, that deer knows I was there. <coughs> and he moves on. How long is your scent for? <coughs> I believe your scent is there for like 30 days. <coughs> I mean, a dog can pick it up 10 days later. It doesn't mean he can track it, but 10, 15 days later. And a dog don't even smell as good as a deer. I would say a lot of it has to do with weather. I think the biggest thing that uh, takes away scent is wind. Wind really uh, depreciates it quick. But uh, when you think about a deer's nose, it's so incredible. That's what people don't get. They think if they didn't get seen, or if they have a sneaky way of getting into something, deer won't figure it out. I can think of spots where I used to look at it like, well, if I can find a way to get in there, where that deer won't even relate me to his spot. Like come up to a fence line that is so thick with vines and stuff, he can't get through it. So he's living on this side and I'm coming in from this side. And I did that at, at Dave's farm on a, a buck that was in this one bedding area. And there, there was snow on the ground and the next day I come out and find his tracks hitting mine and following him right up my tracks, right into that tangle, right to the tree, sniffing my, my steps going up the tree. I couldn't believe it. They will find you and they'll figure you out. They track us down. They, you know, 
they are uh, much more intelligent than people give them credit for, in my opinion. There's certain ways they're stupid. I mean, because they don't have the reasoning abilities. But they know, you know, what human scent is, and they, they fear it. What would be your desired wind direction for this spot specifically? Anything not blowing at the deer. So, so it's a big difference from hill country to this. And in hill country, those deer are usually specifically bedded based on the wind direction, right? What they do here is their individual bed might be based on the wind so that they can see a little opening or something. But they'll bed here, you know, if it's a west wind, five yards that way if it's an east wind. Because it, really it's sound based. Try to walk through that slop to get to yeah. it. They hear you coming. So they'll, they'll just bed all over in there on any wind. And I don't see them coming out of beds uh, wind directional. You know, there's people that'll say, I've had people argue with me about it. They'll say that uh, bucks always walk nose into wind. And I've also had people say they always walk tailwind so they can smell what's coming from behind them. And I don't see either of that to any regard. What I see is I hunt, regardless of the wind in, in marsh country, and uh, um, I've killed deer on every single wind, probably equally. So, say the buck bedding's over there and you see bedding back here, would you still hunt this if the wind was blowing in that bedding there? I'd probably, uh, uh, it depends. Now, if I'm expecting that to be smaller deer yeah. that I don't care about, I don't care if it's smell me. Okay. Smell me and leave. But if, if I think there's a target animal in there or something I want to shoot, I might be waiting for the wind to go a little more that way. Okay. And, and most of the time, I'm serious, I would only hunt this spot once in a year, if that. A lot of the spots I don't hunt once a year. But I say that with a grain of salt because most of you guys haven't scouted the amount of property that I have and probably do not have the number of spots that I have. So I don't want to tell you not to hunt it more than once. That's fair. But, um, but I would wait for the right wind and I'd hunt someplace else until I had it. So if you have to have the wind blowing off a little bit not to blow these deer out of here, yeah, yeah. I would I would probably hunt with the wind going like that. Um, <laughs> if you look, you'll see a little opening in that uh, cedar tree. I've hunted out of there a couple times recently. Not recently, in the last five years. And I've hunted off the ground over by that uh, dead tree. Um, I, I'm not afraid to push the envelope. Like, I, I, myself, I'd probably hunt this knowing bucks were out there. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't worry about this too much myself. Correct. But even, even hunting here, there's a very good chance you're going to blow deer out of this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, you've got to be willing to kick some deer. Yep. you got to push some envelopes. Um, every now and then, one of them will run in here and spook your buck. But I've also had deer run through, and an hour later your buck gets up anyways and comes in. It's not like you want them to do that, but if you don't push that envelope, you're afraid of spooking a doe, you're never gonna kill big bucks. You have to be willing to take a few risks. I mean, deer spook from lots of things, so if a uh, bunch of deer run by your target buck, he doesn't necessarily know what just bumped those deer past him. It could have been, I don't know, them crossing the road and running from a car, or maybe a coyote stood them up and pushed them quick. I mean, if I'm wrong, you're right, I don't know. Right, I, I don't really, if they run out of an area and they leave it, I usually don't see them come right back. Sometimes they do. What I usually do is if I spook a deer out of a bed area that's a target, I will hunt it again the next day, and maybe one out of five times that buck will come back. Most of the time, he just moves to a different spot. But not till the next day. You don't think if you kick them out and they see you keep going that they'll circle back? Oh yeah, around yeah, yeah I agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying I wouldn't hunt it the same day. Yeah, I'm just saying I'd come back again the next. Oh day. okay. But I wouldn't wait two or three days. Yeah. Give them time to go find your scent. Right. Okay. It's like there's a, a, a vast array of big buck bedding areas. And what I try to do is learn them all. But he could be in any one of those, right? But there's certain ones he'll peek in at certain times of the year. And what you got to do is you got to be the detective. So you want to be in that spot when that buck is there. So you have to be able to look at that bedding area and say, when is this buck here? Why is he here? What wind is he here on? You know, and try to hit it right. So when we put cameras in those bedding areas, which I would not recommend because it spooked the deer quite a bit. It took a long time for them to get used to it. And they, in some cases, they never did. But we did it anyways to try to learn some things. And what I saw was these two weeks periods, like uh, we had one buck in one of these uh, uh, studies that two years in a row, there was a two week period when he showed up, you know, like in 14 days, five to seven times, five times one year, seven times the next year. And otherwise he was only in that, that bedding area, you know, 20 times in two years. 
<laughs> so now if you, if you looked at that from a vast study and said, he's only there 20 times in two years, what are my odds of killing that buck, right? Well, my odds are pretty good if I go during that two week period. Just when he's right. there? Right. So really, it gets more and more involved as you go with this, starting to figure out the timing and stuff like that. So it's not easy it just in any time. regards. What's that? Does it just take time to learn that stuff? It does. Um, but you can start to read it. You can start to look at, well, why do I think this deer is here? And sometimes you're going to be wrong, but sometimes you're going to be right. Is he here because there's an oak flat there he's feeding on? Is he here because there's a doe bedding area adjacent? Is he here because, you know, you look at the amount of rubs and say this bedding area is tore up with rubs, but the bedding isn't that worn out. Well, he's probably there right at that rut period, right? You know, just in that one week, you know, like right at the end of October, usually before actual rut because that's when you're monitoring the does. But you can start to put pieces together as you hear because of food sources, you hear because of this, that, the other thing. Look at how old the rubs are, you know, things like that. And start to put the pieces together, make educated guesses instead of random guesses. Like when I first started this out, I didn't know any of that. It's stuff that I'm learning as I go and I'm, I'm constantly learning. You know, you're putting cameras out there to learn rather than to hunt, right? And you just keep advancing. You know, when I first started out, I would just hop from bedding area to bedding area to bedding area based on how good they looked. But over time, I started figuring out that, you, you know, when I go later, it doesn't look as good as it did earlier. And you start going earlier, right? Okay. You start, you start figuring that out, and then you start watching with cameras. So this has been a long process for me, and it's still, I'm still learning, which is what keeps it fun, right? Oh, yeah. Um, when you find a spot there, like, where the bedding area, do you go in on a just offwind or downwind, or how do you set up on that? So when I go in on a bedding area, I, I look at where they're bedded, I look at uh, why, when, and how they're bedded here. Usually in this terrain, it's not wind specific, but there is things wind specific. Like if they're bedded on a point, a lot of times if the wind is blowing back, like straight up the point, like in your favor, they'll bed up on the point and look down the point. Because right. they're, they're bedding on that point for a reason. But if you're because on the downwind if, if, side, you're not going to move that way, do you think? Yeah, he will. Yeah, he will. He will. Okay. They, they move the same regardless of the wind. I think they might feel a little safer if they got the wind, wind to their nose, <laughs> per se, right. but they'll still move. And if you're within that 100 yards or whatever that I'm getting in, they move in daylight all the time, mm -hmm. you know. But they will take and they'll bed up in that point where they can watch the point if they can't smell it. See what I'm saying? What, what I, so what I would say is... that they're more interested in what way the wind is... Let's put it like this. I feel like that buck's got a bedding spot, right? Around that, he's got what he would think is a safe zone. Where he thinks from that bedding point, he can monitor anything coming at him, either from sound, from smell, from hearing, what you know, whatever. Yeah. But he can monitor anything coming at him to that point. Within that zone, he feels he's safe, right? My job is to get to the edge of that zone mm -hmm. where he feels like he can wander around anywhere in there on the trail that he uses to come out and poke him in there. Right. So that's what I'm doing. So he is going to feel safe in there regardless. Yeah. yeah. You see more wind-based travel when they get away from bedding when they're out looking for does and things like that. Around in bedding areas, it's more more a matter of having the wind in your favor and a wind that he'll bed there. Right. When they're bedding, when he's specifically mm -hmm. yep. bedding. Do you find that uh, it's multiple bucks using the same bed, or is it just one? And if you harvest one buck out of there, do you tend to go back? Because another buck's moved in. Um, do they tend to bed in the same areas? <laughs> That's a pretty common question. So um, I've got bedding areas out here that, like where we shot the Rome Legend, we've taken 12 good bucks out of that same bed. Okay. Um, we've got another spot where I've taken over a dozen between me and my friends out of the same beds. Um, but let me put it like this. Um, when I look at my big box, the, the like three-year-olds and the two-year-olds um, have been in those repeat spots. Usually the first buck I shoot is the big one. It's almost always a brand new spot when I kill a monster, when it's five, six, seven years old, which is why I don't get too angry when people steal my spots, because it's already done, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, they seem to figure out when you're hunting there. I think if you left it alone for a year or two, you never went back, it'd probably you know, come back around. But yes, bucks will bed in those same spots over and over again. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've seen where a buck will be bedded there and another buck comes in, and it'll be a matter of which one's more dominant and one will move. Especially if it's towards rut. If it's not towards rut, maybe one just goes off to the side and beds near the other one. But towards rut, whichever one's more dominant, the other one will get up and leave. 
makes sense because they're betting there for a reason. When I shot the Rome Legend, the rub line uh, was opened back up a couple days later. And I went back out there because of that. And another buck got out of his exact same bed, a 10 pointer. But it wouldn't come near me, probably because of the gut pile of blood underneath me. But I tried it anyways because of the rub line. Um, but you see it over and over again, these bucks bed in the same spots. And like when I said we did those camera studies, you'd have the same buck that your target buck bedding there you know, all these days. And you'd see the bucks on the camera come in and kick the other one out. And you'd see other bucks bed there, and there would be multiple bucks. And another thing we saw too that was real surprising to me from the camera studies was that those bucks bed in those beds very short periods. Like one to three hours for bedded there. But they're in the area, they'll hop from bed to bed. Which is probably a reason you see so many beds in a bedding area. You know, a lot of people um, talk about a single bed. Usually you don't find that. You do occasionally. Usually what you have is a spot about you know, a quarter acre to two acres of a lot of beds where these deer open. And then you're on the exit coming out. So you kind of got to, when you go into scouts, you got to look at all the beds so you can see, you know, what they can see and smell and hear, you know, before you set up. But they'll have an area, kind of like what this was. This was an area. There was a whole bunch of spots they could bed in there, but it was a tight little spot that you're coming from, right? Not one singular spot. Do you think that is like the multiple spots? Is that from minor little wind changes or current changes in there? Or is that just the kind of, do you think their nature, they just get up and kind of relocate after a couple hours? Uh, I, I think they move constantly probably because of uh, wind and thermal changes as it changes. I think they're smelling things and sitting in exact positions because of that. One thing I've noticed uh, when I track them in the winter, and a lot of times I do this just to learn. You follow a buck's tracks, when they're going to bed, You'll see him go into a bed and walk right to a specific bed, stand in the bed and walk around in the bed, and then walk to another bed, stand in it and walk around to another bed, and then finally they bed down. And I think what they're doing is they're smelling the wind currents or something. But there's something going like. on where they're looking at each bed individually and choosing one. And uh, if you start following tracks around, you'll see that. Cool. I got a question about a bed I found not too long ago. <clears throat> I was in the cattails like these right here, mm -hmm. and I went out to a dead little dead tree. Like you said, there's a lot of times there's a mound of dirt there. Yep. So <clears throat> I went up to it, sure enough, there's a mound of dirt, and it, you see the bed where the deer is laying. It looked like a pretty good sized deer. He's laying like 30 yards from the road, mm -hmm. right where people walk into the state land to go hunting. They, they walk right by him, they don't even know it's there. Well, my question is, <clears throat> I didn't find any rubs. I found hair in the bed. I knew it was deer. No rubs, and there's no trees nearby that it could be rubs. So should I still assume that's a buck laying there? Or is it possibly a doe laying there? That's a good question. Uh, if the bed is really used, used well, not just once, I would say it's probably what I would consider a buck bed. But um, here's what, here's the difference, is um, does, when they're singular, one or two does, sometimes three, but one or two does, you know, if it's, if it's three, it's a doe and two fawns. But the small numbers will bed in buck bedding areas, just like the bucks do, uh, quite often. But when, as soon as you get a group of does, they bed totally different. And bucks do it too in velvet. They'll bed out in more open areas before you get to the bedding, like not down there, up here, right? And they'll bed in a circle, and they'll each watch out a different direction. And if you find the beds, like in snow or, or even in dirt, if you can see them, because they move them a lot, so you don't see them as well in dirt. But in snow, when you see does bed, they'll bed in that circle, each looking out a different direction. So most of the time, those does are bedded like that, that circular fashion, up higher, watching for danger. Those look out for the group. They're the mom, the family person, right? Or the bucks are solitary, they are they just worry about themselves, right? So they bed different. So you can kind of figure that out. A buck will go into a spot, you'll look at it and you'll be like, okay, I want an obstacle to my back. I'm gonna put this tree up against me, this deadfall. I wanna see over there. I wanna be able to smell over here. And when you look at the beds, and you use that detective thing I'm talking about, right? You'll be able to say, okay, I can see what he's doing here. That's a buck. So what you're probably looking at is a buck bed. But that doesn't mean you won't occasionally see a doe bed in there. All right, the reason we stopped here is I really wanted to point out the way you can look across the marsh. So we're looking across this, and you see this little island of trees here? And how it tapers down to a point, right? And then if you look, it has a couple trees out, you know, just connecting it to this wood lot over here. We're really out in these cattails, that's pretty much water. 
right? Except for that island. So those points are some of the favored stuff for bucks to bet on out here. So if you can find these little timbered points, those bucks like to bed right around the point, the tips of those points, and monitor the danger. Now the reason they do that is because where's danger gonna come from? Right here. Well, it's gonna come from land, right? right. So it'll come right down the point. Yeah. It'll come down to the land. So they can monitor the danger coming from one way. See what I'm saying? If people tried to come through this to them, you're walking through water, basically. So most of your really good betting is going to be on some sort of feature like that, a land point or something. And the ones that faced predominantly downwind seem to work the best. So, and this one faces downwind with the west wind blowing away it is today. Um, puts the deer right at the tip of this, smelling anybody coming down that point. Now that doesn't mean when the wind isn't blowing west, they don't bed there. They'll still bed there. It's just that spot more often they have the wind in their favor and they seem to like those better. I seem, I still find beds on the windward sides, just less of them, not as good, right? And what I do is I never walk that road back to where I want to hunt. That's just something I don't do, it's not in me. So when I go out to hunt, even if I'm on pending at being in a spot in a mile back, I come in here and I'll follow a transition line and make my way out the long way because if I hit hot sign, it's way better than a spot where I think a deer might be. There's a deer there. So I'm always looking for that hot sign. So a lot of times I don't even make it to where I, I'm going. But because of that, I'll come through here a couple times a year. And uh, two years ago when I came back here, there was a tent set up right here. There was a climbing stand in a tree over there and there's like three trail cameras right here. And I'll, I had to wonder, is this one, is one person or <laughs> a person a group or they know each other? Or, you know, it was weird. But, uh, you know, what do you think would put deer in this spot, you know, timing-wise, detective-wise? Yeah. yeah, I mean, acorns are a problem in a lot of hunting spots. Like you get in the hill country or farmland or whatever, oaks are dropping, deer aren't getting up and moving, they're staying right where they're at, eating acorns. In marshes, they're like little mini food plots. Look around, where else do you see oaks? You know, you see some on the neighboring property. You know, I don't even know if those are, there's one over there. But really, this is the biggest patch of oaks, right? So it's a draw, this is like a food plot. So when this is dropping acorns, on those years, there's deer here. People have caught on to that though, because I mean, we're right next to the parking lot. And they hunt it. But the layout is still really good to, to, to look at. Now, what interests me is when people come out here and hunt, why do they end up right here? You know, I think the last time we were here, we noticed there's a hook, I think in that tree, bull hook. I can't see it. Right there, right. Yeah, yeah I saw finger. it last time we were out here. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they come across that water, they come up here and they're like, okay, there's deer sign. There's usually some love to it. There wasn't acorns this year, so there's not. There's usually five letters, no hunter. But usually there's a bunch of love to it. Right? So you come up here, and which way do you go? You walk over there, you get the sense over there, you walk over there. Probably Most people will set up right here. Probably afraid to go in too much farther right. bump something else out. Yeah. Probably. So I don't look at it like that. I look at it as uh, by the time a deer gets here, it's pretty late. It's when you're walking through acorns to get here. So I know that those deer bed on points, and even if they don't, if they're bedded further back, they travel those points. That's how they come in and out of these spots. So I would expect that point or this point to be the one, and that being the downwind one that tapers down into grass, I would expect the deer to be bedded down there. So when I come into something like this, even if it's deer in hunting season, maybe I never walked here before, whether scouting or hunting, I'm going to be looking at this and I'm going to be looking at the sign coming from that way, and I'm going to follow this trail back until I find a spot to hunt. And I'm going to try and base it on the first oak. So I know the oaks are going to be in a hot, little higher ground, and if I can hit that first oak, if that deer makes it to that oak and feeds there and there only, I can hit him. All right? So basically what I'm gonna do is follow this trail back and try to find a setup without busting the deer off of the point. Make sense? And I'm gonna try and find a wind where it's not bothering. Now generally the wind blows right down this point. So what would work best for me is like a wind like this. You know, off to the side, or maybe like that, or a complete opposite. You're talking about being able to shoot to the first oak? Either or. There's those deer who stop here and feed. Okay. What you're talking about the first note when you're coming from this, the first note? From the deer. Correct. From the bed. Correct. Because I don't see any reason a deer of any maturity would make it to this point. 
which is why I don't understand why some people are And literally, most of you were probably thinking, well, when that guy comes up here, I understand why he's on here. It makes sense. He doesn't want to spook the, the island, right? But when you think of it in the terms that I'm thinking, it starts to make sense, don't it? So let's, uh, let's hold our questions till we look at this, but let's walk this trail back. And as we do, look at the old, old rubs. A lot of them aren't from this year, but look at the old rubs, the scrapes and stuff that come up this trail. And you can see how you can just follow this back to the deer like a map. Last hole. I would expect those deer to be starting to bed as soon as those cattails start mixing the trees uh, down on its points. I would also expect uh, exterior bedding to come in from like these willows along the, <coughs> in the cattail brush over there, right? But mostly come in right through here. So this is about where I'd set up. I'd probably get into like this oak cluster here. Um, so I'd have to do one of two things. I'd have to now when I find it, climb up the tree and make sure I got a spot where I can shoot. Or when I get here, find a spot where I can shoot from as I'm hunting. So when I come in hunting, I'll have to find a spot that's already cleared because if you're cutting, you're gonna spook those deer. In Wisconsin, we can cut limbs on the tree we're in. That's the way the law works, up to an inch in diameter. But if you're if you're sawing through a tree and there's a buck bedded right there, he's gonna hear you. Mm -hmm. What I do carry with me is a clippers, like a gardening clippers, a really sharp, good one, not a cheap one. Because you can just clip those branches off quietly if you hold them and they won't make a sound. And sometimes you have to do that to get a stand against a tree, you know. So uh, a little clip here or there, but if you have to cut something, or you're on private land, I would do that now, this time of the year. Because really, those deer aren't here right now, which is what makes it such a good time to scout. We're not kicking them out of here. The sign we're looking at that scrape is from rut. The, the rubs are from early season. This isn't, the deer aren't here. We're looking at last year's sign. We're not kicking deer out of beds usually, right? So we're setting up here four deer that are gonna be here this fall. They're not here right now. So now we can get away with a little bit, where if you did that in season, they're gonna know. You were coming in to hunt here, which side would you come down based on the wind? Uh, I would be, well, if I'm blowing that way, I'd be hugging this side. Blowing that way, I'd be hugging that side. That side, I really can't hug. Which I, I kind of look at, I hope the wind's blowing this way. You know, kind of is now. So, um, and then I might hunt this side a little heavier too. Like with the wind the way it is, it's kind of blowing like this. That ain't the greatest. So I might want to hug a tree like that. Like that oak tree on the side. <clears throat> Try and get in that and blend in. There's a little V right where that deadfall is. Just kind of get underneath it, maybe, and blend into that back tree and just sit there. And then you'd have your wind over there. But I am taking that wind into consideration. And a lot of times I'm not ending up in an exact tree, especially in a spot where the wind usually blows at the deer, because then it's a little iffy which tree you're going to be in when you're out here. Do the do the deer travel kind of on the edge? Of either edge or do they just kind of right in the middle or wherever they're gonna follow Dependent. the main trails out of here as you can see we're on one but I happen to know there's a real good one right along that edge and there's probably one over here too the trouble is you start getting over there shooting over there is a little bit of a poke you know you start pushing 30 40 yards which I have a hard enough time killing by 20 so <laughs> uh, what I would say is when you're coming in close like this there is some things you got to use you got to have a system what I mean by that is, is that a lot of guys are just cluttered messes when you go out hunting with them. Because I, I hunt with a lot of friends or something, or I take somebody hunting, and you see they'll have a backpack full of crap, and you're like, what are you doing? You know, you going camping? Because these guys will take more stuff on their hunting trip for an evening than I take on a, you know, three-day camping trip. So what I take is what I can fit in my pocket, and I stand and stuff, because I want to be real quiet, minimalized. Every pocket in my hunter safety vest, has something in there and it's in the same pocket every time. I'm a very disorganized person, but when I hunt, I'm organized. And there's a reason for that. I've gotten to your tree and you don't have your release. I've gotten to the tree and you don't have your rope, or you're finding it and you're making noise or you're looking around, right? I have my stand set up in a way that I know how it comes apart. I got it on my back. I'll come up to a tree like this. See, I'm looking at the bedding here. I slide it to the tree. I'll look to a flat spot. I'll get that stand, remember the grass is going to be high, right? I'll get that stand off, I'll set it down real quiet in a spot where I can work. I'll get my bungees off, I'll unscrew the screw, I'll get my steps up. And the way my sticks are, or any stick you're climbing with, whatever you're using, that bottom stick should be about where your knee is, that's your stride. You know, unless you're using some sort of aider or something. But your first step should be right here. 
And, you know, with mine, I, I have a system for setting my next stick on top of the other one in the top is where I put the, the next one. But I come up the tree like this, on this side. So I'm using the tree to block me as I climb. And I'm watching as I go, so I don't get too high. So that deer doesn't spot me climbing. So as I'm going, I can kind of monitor with this tree blocking me. And then when I get to a height where I think I can get away with, I reach around, I set the tree stand on in front of the stand like this, and I screw it around. And then I'll just, that last stick I'll put on the side here, and I'll just step into the stand like that. And then when I get in the tree, and I'm facing the deer, I'll sit down, and when it gets to prime time, what I usually do is I fold my seat up halfway, and I sit on the rim of it, something like this. So all I have to do is go like this to stand. Unless it's really quiet, then I feel like I can sit the most of the time. But once the deer is coming, I put my back to the tree, so I blend in with the tree, because a lot of these trees, you ain't got no cover. You know, the oak tree is a little bit of the exception, or the willow tree. But a lot of them, I don't have any cover. So I'll get in line with the tree like this, looking at the deer, and I usually take the limb of my bow and I block the deer as he's coming, so he doesn't see my face image. And I'm ready at all times. And the very first shot I have at the deer I take, first ethical shot, because when those mature deer get in close, they have a tendency to, to, to uh, bust you really easy. Especially once they get to within 10 yards, try drawing a bow. Most of these deer out here, when, when I shoot a five-year-old buck, that buck has war wounds. He got that at age, getting arrows into the shoulder, shot in the neck, shot in the leg. You, you, we clean these deer, we're pulling broadheads out of them, slugs out of them, all kinds of stuff. These deer do not get to that age by not learning some strong lessons and they hear the slightest noise, they're gone. And how many of you remember that buck from two years ago that I shot back here that uh, when it came up out of the marsh onto that point? The one you had the dog on? Yeah, yep. exactly. We're gonna look at that spot. But that buck, remember that's that little noise of me pulling back, it just made a little bit of a click. I mean, you could hardly hear. And that buck just locked and stood there for like, I don't remember what it was, like three minutes? Forever. Yeah, well, I was at full draw. Luckily, he settled down enough that he gave me a shot, but any little off thing. So the first shot I have, I, sh I take. And if I have a chance to pull the bull back before he gets to me, I will, and I'll just hold it. But that's mm -hmm. only if I have the chance. I like to pull the bull back when I'm gonna shoot. Man, this is a little closer than you normally hunt, right? Normally you would hunt the bed, the bed would be in those woods over there, right? You don't ah. normally hunt this close to bed. No, this is probably more normal than that. Okay. It looks like a longer distance on video. That's one of the great things about this, you see actual distance. A lot of times I'm within like, I think the perfect distance is about 50 to 75 yards in the swamp. And you get into hill country or farm country, you're usually further back, 100, 200 yards. Probably what you're thinking, right here. Yeah. But I usually push that envelope pretty close. Now you start getting further back, like, like even say you get back into here, maybe the oaks don't start further back, and you just think for comfort, you'd rather be up on the top of that hill. You have a good chance he's gonna follow this edge and go out. You have a good chance he comes up to here and he turns and he goes over to those trees. The further back you get, the more likely something's gonna go wrong. So I wanna be right on top of him. A common question I'll get is, well, you know, you're coming in like that, the deer are gonna smell you. Well, they're gonna smell everybody else that walks up that trail too. And people, as you've seen, as we're out here, people are walking up and down that trail. People walk dogs here too. Non-hunters use this property all the time. But now you get more remote, and that might make a difference. I'm probably walking pretty fast, as you noticed, until uh, <laughs> until I get to where the water is and stuff, so I'm not making sloppy noise. And then I'll just take it easy and watch where I step. And then it's it's uh, as I get on this island, I'm gonna be a little more careful. Um, based on hitting the briars and stuff, because they make a, a unique noise against your clothes. If they slap a stand on your side or something, they'll make tinks and stuff. So I'll be a little more careful coming through here. And I don't know about how long it's going to take. It ain't going to take long, but I'm certainly going to be careful. Um, there are some things where you don't have to be as careful, like wind, rain. You know, um, when it's dry out and calm, sometimes you can't get to spots because the leaves are so crunchy. And those spots I'll wait till it rains or a day that's wet and the leaves aren't making noise, right? Or you have a windy day. If a deer can, could possibly see you, wind is huge. It's blowing everything around. You can slide in that on a windy day. So I'll have certain areas that I'll use certain things that I'll wait for to get into. You, know? you said that you'll get up to where you can just see over the tops of the cattails because in the 
fall, they're taller. Yep. Um, I've seen on a lot of your videos too, you're like, I'm only a stick and a half up or I can touch my stand or mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is. So you'd rather be in this tree and stop right at the top of the cattails to be closer than say be 18 feet Oh, I'd rather be 18 feet there. up back there. You would be? Oh, yeah. Or you'd rather be? Yeah, I think my best case scenario is 18 feet up. Okay. You but know? you're stopping purposefully in this one. Yeah. So he this isn't where I'm hunting in this you. situation. I'd be back here. Yeah, okay. But in a lot of situations, this is what I have. Yeah. You know. In this case, I have something better. Right. Right? But when you're seeing, me, you're when you're seeing me a stick up or something, it's because that's all I have. Right. But, uh, there ain't much for trees. This spot here is... Um, invasive buckthorn tree. I'm thinking I can stick a stand right here at head level and just sit in this little hole here and I can shoot up the trail that way. I can shoot this trail here and here and here. And all the trails that I would call buck trails go through here. Okay. Which, in a lot of cases, that's why there's big bucks there. Right. You put mature trees there and people will find it and people will hunt it. A lot of guys, you know, they want to either hunt off the ground or they want to hunt in a secure, nice tree. And a lot of places are in between that. But it's going to be a little bit funky trying to get a stand in here. So, we'll get her done. And then, uh, hopefully I can get it in a spot where I can get an arrow out of it. I'm going to be at eye level with these things, so I'm going to have to be alert. They're, uh, it's too thick and high on the ground level. And there's no, no real trees. you got to get in kind of a bush. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I shine because a lot of the terrain, that's where those big bucks will hold up. Like buckthorn is a huge one. We don't have a lot of it out here, but there's a lot of vast areas in uh, uh, southern Wisconsin, and now it's kind of spreading across the country. It's an invasive species, but it's uh, growing huge areas of this vast buckthorn where you really can't get a stand. I'll find a way to get a stand. Here's my setup. My stand's right here. I'm just tucked into this hole in the tree. I got the trails over here, 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 and here. I'm going to put my camera arm right here. I'm just going to try and slip into that tree. I even put uh, leaves on top of my my extra sticks. Hoping if they come in here they don't see them. I laid this branch across this trail because there are some big tracks in this trail. If one comes like this, I wanted to turn and go over here and give me a shot. But it gets clear on the ground where you can't sit on the ground because it's just wide open. And there's really nothing to put a stand, but you can kind of find somewhere and you can get get it in between the limbs, you know, and get just off the ground. Those spots have been really good for me because nobody can find a way to hunt them. <laughs> you just have to find the way. You have to find the buck and then however you got to hunt them, you got to hunt them. But the main thing is that you find where the bucks live. So if you came in here and those hunters were over here, you walk, you would walk past them and still hunt this? Probably not because I would probably figure the buck ain't, ain't here if they're here. Okay. That close. Right. But if, if uh, they were back by the road there, I'd find a way around them. Usually I'll avoid walking right underneath them if I can because you don't want to piss somebody off or ruin their hunt. But uh, a lot of cases, uh, guys are set up in spots they don't even realize where they're blocking the whole woods. You know, how are you supposed to get out there and hunt, you know? Dan, it might seem remote. you talked about this on the walking trail coming in. You talked about this is a predominant west wind bedding, or predominant west point anyway. Um, can you talk about a little bit about where you would expect that buck to be on an east wind coming up and in a little ways looking down the point? Where in this vicinity, just because it's in perspective right now, would you kind of expect that buck to be with an sure. east wind? Sure. So what he's getting at is bucks bed different on these points based on wind. So um, with, a, with a west wind, I would find that buck more on those trees tapering down into the grass. But on an east wind blowing up this point, I would expect them to be more in here, like where that deadfall is, or right in this grass and up close. Because he's going to be more monitoring the point. Because back there he can smell it. If he can't smell it, he's going to want to hear it or something. He's going to want to hear if something's coming down. And I tend to see them up higher <coughs> when the wind's not in their favor so that they can monitor by noise or sight, is what he's getting at. Anything else? For a spot like this, Dan, are you usually, I mean, you, you said there's crop fields back there. Are you only focusing on this when there's oaks or if there's crop fields, is there a chance that the bucks are going off that way too and you have to t change your tactic? Sure there is, yeah. So uh, you can hunt on the other side, there's crops. So you can hunt this on two different time frames or two different uh, ways of movement. Or if you're moving both ways at the same time and you don't know which is which. Or you're taking a guess. 
you hunt this one day and that the next, or you could hunt over here, hear something, and then move. But that side typically has travel going that way too. I usually go on rubs that go by height, height to center. So I would say that that's probably a three-year-old fall. You know, start getting around here, it's usually two-year-old, and below here is like one and a half. And I don't go by the height, a lot of guys will go really, like, you know, it's a six-foot rub. That's just time tip. What really is important is the, the center of where the fur rubs, because that's dictating the height of the back of the paw, which dictates the age class. I know it's not 100% accurate, but it is fairly accurate. You start seeing rubs when they're up this high to center, it's almost always a mature buck. Year and a half old bucks just aren't rubbing up that high. Um, so I don't really go by diameter as much. I mean, uh, I can remember a, a few different occasions when I was hunting near big rubs and had these tiny bucks in the rubber. In one case, I, I remember, I was a kid, but it still sticks in my mind really well that I had found these rubs on these pine trees that were like this big around, and I'm like, oh, there's gotta be a monster coming in here, and I'm sitting over those rubs. And a spike buck came in and started working on <laughs> <laughs> So the, the diameter doesn't always tell you everything. The height is really important to me. Um, this area has a couple big rubs, and that would catch my attention as to why they're there. Because we're close enough to bedding, obviously, and not sitting on food. Well, a little bit with the oaks, but they're coming from somewhere to do this. And if I looked at a map, I would see there's an island out here and another island out there, and this comes to a point over here. And uh, this still seems like it's really close to the parking lot, but that particular island I've had a lot of success on. But that little wood lot there is probably the most pressured area in here, and this obviously gets pressured. I mean, we just, I don't know if you guys noticed it, but sticking out of that tree there as you're walking by, I noticed the screw stuff. And I've seen uh, guys hunting climbers right here and other stands on this point. But it seems like those deer will walk through these people spots at night knowing that it's safe. They just won't go near it during daylight. They just don't come through here. But that area right there I've had some luck on. This spot still seems to produce, although I only hunt it every, once every probably couple years. I try to hit this on certain years. Um, can you guess when? Eight points? Yeah. Usually when those oaks are dropping, I like to hit it then. Because um, it puts those deer right here and they come up out of this point. There's uh, two major spots that come out of here. They come out of that island over there, or they come out of this island over here. This island's hard to see because it's got dead ash. But mixed in there is some dogwood and stuff. But there's two heavy trails that come into here and meet in here. So um, when I first started hunting, this was really a problem because one of the trails came out over there, one of them over here, and these deer would always go that way, and those deer would always go that way. It was like you could do one or the other, and no doubt they'd always come on the other side. But now, Every time the snow comes in real heavy and lays down cattails and stuff, the trails seem to change. And the last time the trail started coming out right here, and it stayed there, and this comes out right here. You kind of hit them both from right here now. Um, but this has been good. I mean, it's last light, but you get these deer, even though I'm going right through hunters right there, and right through hunters over there. I'm still seeing good bucks here. Now, I only hunt it once every couple years, um, but I've had good, good opportunities in those few times I've hunted. So probably one out of four times that I've hunted this, I've seen a decent animal. Um, one of them was a, a giant eight-pointer I was hunting one time that was probably close to Boone and Crockett, and he actually was working better on the island. We've had a couple times when he fed just off the point here. He got up out of the cat cells right there and seemed to know I was here. He probably heard me setting up. My favorite story of this spot is where we turned off of the human trail and turned into those trees. If we would have went about 10 feet further up and you looked across you'd have saw there's a cornfield there on the private land and I came back here one time um, it had snowed till about uh, three or four in the morning and I thought well I'm gonna cut a buck track follow it back to bedding and set up on them coming out and I hit a big buck track coming out of that corn that I knew was fresh because it just stopped snowing and it came down through here right down here right towards that island so I climbed up with a climber, went way up as high as I could. And then I turned around to hunt, and I could see the buck better on the point looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's one of those turning points back then when I started realizing that you should probably come up the back side of a tree and watch around. <laughs> right. That was one of those lessons.
But uh, I sat in that tree the whole day staring at that buck, and he sat in that spot staring at me. And other than every now and then looking to the side, he would just put his head right back up and stare at me. And no matter how motionless I, I was, he never moved until it was black and I got down. <laughs> what do you think, you're a raccoon or something? I don't know, you wouldn't come in. <laughs> we, ha we have uh, like a, a variety of that. Like uh, when we do drives and stuff, you'll have uh, some guy will just nonchalantly slam the door and just see a deer jump up 200 yards away and take off. Then you have other deer, you do the whole drive and you walk them back and all of a sudden it jumps up where you already walk. Right. You know, some deer are different than others, just like people. You know, there's some people that, uh, you know, if you're confronted with somebody, they, they run and they hide and depend on 911. And there's some people that walk towards it. You know, everybody and every animal has a different attitude. When I was younger, probably like 14, 15 years old, I was hunting this little river bottoms where I cut my teeth chasing wood ducks around anyway. I was going in to hunt it. And I couldn't tell you what he was looking back, maybe 140s, maybe 150s buck. He, as I was walking in, I heard something, I looked over and here he was literally sneaking away, like hunched over like this and there was weeds <laughs> hanging out of his horns and he was just sneaking away. He didn't want to make it known that he was there. Mm -hmm. Like he was trying to sneak away from me. It was unreal. I'll never forget that. I can't tell you how many times I've been out in the, the, the woods or swamps or the marshes and you're walking and you stop for a second and you look beside and there's one bedded and not until you make eye contact with the jump. Like, you wonder how many you walk right past. Yeah. It's, it's probably a lot. Yeah. Dan, would right. you try to climb this naked tree or go push back for some more cover? Uh, I would probably want to be right here because of where that trail is. <laughs> so um, if I came in here and hunted right now, I would probably uh, get into that tree there um, just because it's got a little bit of limb cover. Um, Again, push, pushing closer. So that funnel of their movement is tighter? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I mean, even this spot, once you get to this point, this is it, they, they split up. Some of them go where we just came from, where we saw the big rubs and stuff. Some of them go along here. Okay. You know, for getting here, you're at the pinnacle back. and they'll move to here in daylight. Okay. They, I mean, these deer are getting here in daylight where I can shoot them. And the people that are hunting right there, aren't seeing them. They're out of the game. But I am having year and a half squad through in daylight, which would, is what they're shooting. Sounds like that's what I would That's where most people hunt, obviously. <laughs> is this all tripping off the acorns? No, not necessarily. I see some rut action in here too and stuff. I just find that uh, for a peak movement, when those oaks are dropping, I usually have a deer. But I have seen good movement here during rut. Some of that sign that we were seeing, like I said, it was snowing the day that I saw that big buck. So this spot has had uh, bedding um, at all different times of the year. So it's, it's been good. Um, I don't know if any of you guys watch our gun hunts this year? Oh yeah. Yeah. So a buck that Zeke's dad shot was uh, right where those cedars are over there. See where the red building is? You see the cedars in between us and the red building? That's where he shot that buck. And it was bedded down on that little poplar island poplar right over here. You pretty happy? He's yeah. got really white antlers, eh? Yeah. Where did you see him come out of, Zeke? Um, right, right over there. Yeah, that, that, the, that's where the does came last year, too, is yep. that yep. patch of mm -hmm. rivers. That's why I said this side of the river was a good spot yeah. to push. So given no acorns in this area in general, I mean, what's the main browse? I mean, you got your dog with it, they'll nip the ends off. But, I mean, is there anything else that you would key on or not really? You're just uh, based on bedding, obviously. They are like eating machines that eat everything. Um, there are certain plants that they like more than others, um, but they will come through here and just browse uh, on everything they're coming across. Um, one thing I really see is uh, in early season stinging nettles. Um, they love stinging nettles. Really? You wonder how they can even eat that. Um, but it's a survival food too. Survivalists eat stinging nettles. So. Um, this is all lowland swamp with these small brushy trees. I noticed coming in here we just had to walk through a huge patch of stinging nettles. Um, I got stung quite a bit. They were over our head. Um, and then there's like this orange julep stuff. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but uh, deer love this stuff. And if you look, this is browsed like crazy. See that? Look at that. So they're in here quite a bit. Everywhere I'm looking, the browse is heavy as hell. And there's a lot of good uh, big tracks back there coming out of the swamp. So I'm excited about this spot. Oh, here's a really heavy trail. Look at this. It's like plowed. Holy cow, dude. Yeah, there's a lot of fresh sign on it, too. And look at all the plants here are just mowed to the ground. Oh, yeah. I'm more excited about it now. Yeah. 
You can see, look at that big track. Holy cow, look at this one. Look at that. That's a big track. Look, like the plants are pummeled into the ground. This was after the rain yesterday. Yeah, a lot of this is, yep. One of your early season videos, I don't know which one it was, but you were showing how they had just these greens. Yeah. Natural growing green out here. They just had it growl down. Yeah, orange. Uh, Julius. Julius. That's the big problem. It's just filled with like liquid. Okay. It's got a little orange flower. Right. Oh man, they did love that bunch right down. And later in the season, the dog would right. do a really good draw. I, mean, we'll go I think most people would take this uh, scouting trip and they'd want to see if there's any sheds laid on it. Good see the crops and stuff. But literally, you can walk where we just walked and you know everything you need to know about killing deer. And that's what you need to know. And if you're, if you're spending two weeks out here looking for sheds, you're probably not going to have enough hunting spots this fall to kill deer. So I want to go through here and I want to find those spots quick. So now if we would have just kept going, we'd have found more spots up in the air and we'd have got an array of haunt these areas. Now this area, because of its vastness, always has mature bucks in it, despite the pressure. That's not the case with all public properties. And a lot of what you guys are hunting probably is not as vast as this. The reason I moved out here is because I knew that this would always hold two bucks. But a lot of the properties that I hunt do not have a big book every year. But you go out there, there's one here or there, and you hunt one. You go in there, you see the sign, you see the big rubs and stuff. You go in there, you make setups. And then the next time a deer shows up, you know where he's going to be. Next one comes to age, right? So a lot of times when you scout these areas, you might not find exactly what you're looking for. But you can say, okay, one shows up here. You can't put all your eggs in the basket. So a lot of you guys are going to think they can find one nice property. Let's say, this is my property, this is where I'm going to kill you. But if you do that, you're not going to keep the big bucks consistently. Then you find your spots, people start hunting it like you do. Things change constantly. And you've got to be around. So if you watch my videos, you'll notice that I don't start out in any one spot. I start, I start out just kind of throwing a net out there. Unless I'm on to something really big that I've been seeing. I've been throwing that out. And I hunt this spot, that spot, this spot, try to find some sign, try to see one, try to get one on camera. But once I start seeing box, I start narrowing my focus to this property, to that property, to this property. And then maybe, okay, this is the one I can kill. I'm narrowing on this one. So don't take it like you can look at a property like this. It's different. The rest of your life, you could have made. It's not true. Just say Marsh is a good place to learn. Because the cattails are low and you can see everything over the top of it. You look at a map at certain times of the year, you can see the difference between the cattails and the trees, and you can kind of see how everything works. You can zoom in, you can see the trails. My point on all of this is it's the exact same thing in a tamarack swamp, in a tegia alder swamp, in any swamp, any lowland. It's the same thing, it's just you can't see it over the cattails, right? But if you can see the higher points, the different types of trees, the different terrains, the island trees, the tamarack swamp, right? whether you can see it through the trees, it's still a spot where the deer are going to be. And if you read a map, well, just look at an aerial, well, you can pick that stuff out, and you can go to it. You can still follow those transition lines, you're still going to find the bucks. It doesn't matter where you're at. And when I go to, like, vast tamarack swamps, the big thing I'll hear is, bucks bed everywhere, there's deer everywhere, there's a bed under every tree, I don't know where to find It's just stupid. This whole bed thing's stupid. Right? That's what I'll hear a lot. But when I go out there, what I'm finding is you look at that tamarack swamp and there are beds everywhere. And pretty much if you look around here, you'd probably find beds everywhere too. But those key land features are what hold the big ones. And sometimes it takes a little more work because they're so hidden to find them. But when you find them, you'll find the majority of the bucks are in certain areas of that swamp. It might take a little harder to find them, but you'll still find them locked down in certain areas because they'll have features or maybe even Really, they don't mind because of how they smell the wind and stuff. But uh, there's a, uh, a swamp that me and Eric hunted quite a bit the last couple of years here. Uh, that's three miles across, and it's mostly tamarack and some big, vast areas of dogwood. And uh, there are beds everywhere. We were able to lock right into the box there too, right? Yep. Yep, they're they're hugging tight to terrain features like points and that kind of thing, and that's where we found our setups. Yep. One question I do have for you is, okay, keep your, keep your horizons open and endless, so, no, how far are you willing to travel from home for you to hunt? For me, um, there are times I drive three hours after work, really, not too often, I have to be honest, yeah, but uh, 
Uh, usually it's within an hour. Uh, I, tr I try to keep stuff somewhat close. Uh, but I work on I work an hour before I leave. So I can look around where I work, I can look around where I live. Um, I specifically um, alter my hours at work to fit my lucky needs. So I run a department, so uh, I get off in the afternoon. That includes 12 weeks of vacation. <laughs> I, get, I get five weeks of vacation, and uh, uh, I usually extend that for four. <laughs> and uh, you and the guys there, they can hear it. They drill. Not even close. You won't put that on. Um, but, like I said, we're skipping. Near Wisconsin, near where you on to him, you know he accepts it. And, uh, I was onto a good spot that I knew they could have been in the area. I shot one of the spine there and didn't kill it. The arrow was bit up and broke. And what I did is I went from that spot, and me and Eric went in there. We had to scout it back. We figured out. Because I kind of went into their blind and found that spot hunting. But I think there's going to be something in that dog. We know there's deer in here. And, uh,. Actually, I think we scouted that a little that year, and we actually found a matching set of sheds back. Mm -hmm. We're walking up to the truck, and I look down, what do I see? There's the truck. There it There's is. There's the parking lot. Match set right here. Look at this. Do you see them? Look at that. Yeah, look at that. Good find. How cool is that? Look at that. <laughs> look at that. That is awesome. <laughs> Match set. How about that? <laughs> I wanted to find out exactly where that deer was coming from and get a better position because it looked like deer were getting around me in front of me. So we followed it back and we found that the tree where I killed the buck at um, in just a little further. But, uh, so we had hunted that once before, but we never hunted with the tree and then I shot it. I mean, got me another one. <laughs> Holy smokes. Look at this thing. Holy cow, what a tank. Holy cow. What a tank. He's getting bigger the closer I get. Oh my, look at that. Wow. <laughs> and that was a different buck than the, the one that you used. Now it's funny because I never saw that buck, which usually I'm targeting the buck I've seen. But it seems like everybody in this whole county has seen that buck besides me. I get all kinds of messages and yeah, pictures and trail cam pictures and uh, people who had uh, drone footage of it. And I also had some heat on it, which I usually do. Um, if you shoot big bucks, expect that. Um, I'm lucky in the fact that I film all my hunts because it keeps me from getting in trouble. But I get that everywhere. Every time I shoot a big buck, I get that. I've been hearing a lot more news stories about people getting jealous and doing that. <laughs> One of the posts I read is if you do shoot a big buck, just call the animal right away. Yeah. I just, uh, I just hate that concept yeah. of it. I shouldn't have to do that. Agreed. But I do film everything I do. So even if it's just the recovery, um, you're going to be able to show exactly where it was if it comes down to it. And, uh, which isn't fair because it seems like in the hunting world, it's. Uh, you're not guilty instead of innocent until proven guilty. It seems like it's the opposite. And uh, a lot of times, if uh, you're somebody that's well known, they'll release articles about you being uh, charged, even if you're not on it. So, what's uh, happening with that Alexander Club? Great, correct. You know, correct. your opinion is your opinion on the kid or what's going on, but they it's the burden on the state and on the government. The points are um, it's a safety feature, in my mind. No, I don't know this for a fact. I'm not a deer. But I can tell you, when I look at it, the reason it looks like to me that they bet on those points is because they can monitor danger. When danger comes at a deer betted on a point, it almost always comes down to point. It's very seldom it comes from any other direction. 
So in a swamp, when they're bedded on a point, let's just say they're bedded on a, a straight line, okay? They're bedded on the edge of a transition, right? Danger can come from here, come from here, come from here. It comes from one way. He has to monitor from different directions, right? On a point, it's coming from one direction, right? And if it comes from the swamp, he's going to hear it for a mile. You know, um, if you get into hill country in um, in the hills, the reason they take the points in the hill country is because they, they monitor the wind from over the hill, they monitor the thermals from below, and they got an eyesight vision down the hill. It's even harder to get to them than the points out here. So uh, points kind of uh, limit the ways danger can come at them. It gives them a safety feature. You want to make an escape route easier for them? Yeah, exactly. And that's another thing, too. You can find an incredible spot for a bed. If it don't have a, an escape route, it's useless. You won't find them bedding on a point. Well, you will occasionally. I won't say never. But it's seldom you'll find a really good buck bedding on a point that goes out into a lake. I don't know where to go. Right, because what are they going to do? Jump in the lake and swim across? You'll kill them. Right? Well, they can't do it, though. So, um, at least from their perspective. So, they have to have an escape route. And whenever you find these beds, you will find, like, those beds that come in and out of those points. If you go look at the bed, you'll always see a, a trail that goes off into nowhere land, which is the escape route as well. These bucks, too, um, like I said before, when they come out of bedding, regardless of the wind, I don't think I said this. When they go into that bedding, it's different. When I see them go into the wedding, most of the bedding, most of the time, they circle to the downwind side. They come in and smell the area first, or they walk past, and then end up coming back. So they always want to clear the area before they come in it, but I think after they sit there all day, yeah, it, it's like you're sitting in your living room. Yeah. You, you know you know what's going on. So it's that typical James on the double tractors talking about. Correct. You know, so when you say point, it's you're not talking about a peninsula. It's, it's something that tapers down to right. the same level. Yeah, points can be different things, but usually in the marsh we're looking at a points going down into the water. Okay. Or low land, right? And a thick cover where something can't come out of. But the point itself is usually timbered. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that. I mean, um, me and Eric find points up in vast swamps all the time that is a point of dogwood in cattails where it's all thick, but the dogwood's thinner than the cattails. It's true. Essentially, you're just walking in transition areas to find sign of an animal that you want to pursue. And then from there, you start targeting points. It's a spike of bedding. Yeah, when I come out here to scout, I'm probably going to look at all those points and stuff. And you know, just scouting in the off season, and I'm going to figure an area out because I've already deemed that that area looks good to me. And what's going to make me look at an area in this area, this area of the state, this isn't necessarily everywhere, but right here is we have a huge population. We've got Milwaukee real close, we've got Green, uh, Madison real close, we've got a Conwalk, we've got Jefferson, Johnson Creek, we've got all these towns around here. There's a huge population of people that are really mostly hunters, right? So these places get a lot of pressure. So anything that's dry land, I don't really see big bucks. We, um, in Wisconsin, we can do gun deer drives. People will line up and they will drive everything that is dry. And they will kill everything that's got any kind of set of horns on it. So what I look for is I look for wet ground that's vast, that you could not go through here and drive and kill all the deer. So that's the stuff I want to target. So then I target that stuff, and when I get in there, then I want to go and I want to walk that little transition Look at all the points, fingers, find all the bedding areas. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to be looking at the sign. Is there a sign of big bucks? How much sign of big bucks? Does it look like there's multiple big bucks? Or does it look like, well, there wasn't one last year? Or, you know. And then I'm going to decide whether or not I want to hunt it. But it doesn't mean I won't come back and hunt it. If something shows up later or I think something's in there or, you know. But I'm gonna I'm gonna gauge the property and look at all the bedding at the same time, and then anytime down the road, five years from now, I can hear somebody got a trail cam pick of a you know 200 inch animal back here, and he opened his mouth and let somebody know. And then I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna target those spots that I hunted, and hunt that down. And this goes back to some of your rubs that you're finding. You're getting an idea of when those rubs are being made, so you know if you need to target that in September, October, if you're targeting that. Yeah, that ain't just later. the rubs. It's also you know you're looking at the food sources. You're looking at the bedding. You, you know, one thing that's real important, like if you're seeing bedding areas that are tore up with rubs, they're usually only that aggressive. You know, there'll be rubs in bedding areas, like we see. But if it's really tore up, there's one of two things. There's two bucks either competing really hard, or multiple bucks competing hard, or it's going on during a rut. Because 
not really actually rut, but pre-rut, like the last week of October, you know, or maybe just into November, because that's when they're just so aggressive, they're rubbing trees constantly. You know, and we've actually, uh, uh, you know, about five years ago, or maybe 10 now, uh, I discovered some hunting with Mario back in the, uh, in the uh, conservancies. We started seeing how these bucks were bedding in relation to doe bedding, where they had these beds where they, it was an actual bed, but it was really hard to see. But it was so tore up the ropes, it was crazy. And these bucks would bed, monitoring does exiting the, the bedding areas. And that buck might only bed there three or four days a year, but it's the same three or four days. And if you're there the next year, and we started seeing that, and now I'm starting to find those spots all over the place now that I know to look for them, where they monitor these doe bedding areas. And if you hit them at the right days, there's a buck there. But you'll see that the bed is hard to see. Hard to tell it was bedding there. But man, it rubs there and stuff. And we actually were fortunate enough where Mario sat in the tree, watched that buck get up and rub all those trees. Watched him, you know, monitor the does. And, see. and then it starts clicking. You know, so one thing that helps us a lot is when whenever we see a deer like that, or you see any deer, we go out and in the springtime, this time of the year, we go back and see where that deer came from that we saw from this day. We don't do it during hunt season, obviously. But after hunting season, we'll go back, we'll backtrack. Where did he come from? Why was he there? What was he doing? And then we'll try to learn from that. And that's one of those cases where we were able to go back, see where the rubs were, see where he was sitting, and then started relating that to other spots and finding more of that. But there's reasons they bed in spots. And it's food, it's stoves, it's water, it's convenience, it's pressure. There's different things that put them in different areas. And the more of that you can put together, the more you can put down on an exact time frame when that deer was there. I was shy for 50 kills in the moment like you here because on the video, when you watch it, it looked like you're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> you wouldn't think you'd be this close to a lawn. Well, that's for, that's oh, still too little. Yeah. But I, I didn't think it was anything here. I thought you were I do try to hide there. some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the day that we shot that, uh, I took Dave along, and uh, Dave mostly hunted his farm, and he'd come along with me sometimes. And we came out there, and Dave actually sat on the tip of the island. I was down into the swamp a little ways, and uh, we're on both sides of the bedding. There was two exits coming out of there, and uh, uh, Dave was supposed to get down and meet me in that grass field. We, well, you, we haven't walked past, but when we come out, we'll see there's a grass field near the city's trees. He was supposed to meet me in that grass field. And I was all excited I got that buck. So I come running out there and I'm waiting for him. And he doesn't show up, doesn't show up. And then finally I walk to his tree and he's not there. So I walk back to the grass field and I'm like, he's not there. And it's dead quiet and now it's dark. So I just yell, Dave! And there's no answer. So I yell really loud, Dave! And there's no answer. And you can hear that from here. I'm like, what the hell? So I walk all the way to the back of the truck and he's not there. And I hadn't walked all the way to the stand. So I got a sinking feeling like maybe he's laying dead under the tree or something. So I ran back out to ran to the tree and he's, he's not there. You can see where he sat. There's no sign of him. I yelled for him again. I came all the way out. I yelled for him a couple times out. I got all the way to the road. He's not at the truck. I yelled for him there. Nothing. And then uh, I'm sitting there wondering what to do. And all of a sudden I hear something on the road. Here he is walking down the road. And he walked the wrong way and came out way up in the next road, which is like two miles. <laughs> oh, right through all private property. <laughs> Good thing it was dark. <laughs> he got lost. <laughs> and then I'm trying to tell him, hey, I just shot I just shot this giant buck. And he's like, I got lost back there. <laughs> Stop about that. Stop about that. Now think about it. You're taking my moment. <laughs> It's a long way out. Dude, spooner down. What? Spooner down. I got him. I, I heard you shoot. I nailed him. He is what? down for we the gotta count, go dude. You got to grab my bow and my because you know what? Where is it? It's about a mile down the road. What, did you come out from somewhere else? I couldn't find out there, you know, and I kept backtracking, backtracking. Next thing I know, I'm in the next field, and I started cutting this way. I've been searching for you. Well, I've been yelling. I'm like, I, I, might just, right, I walked all the way back, but I want to grab right. my shit. All right. The cattails are all here. How are you going to? How are you going to navigate? Yeah. So I'm assuming transitions aren't created equally. That's right. I mean, you look at a property it's like this. How do you pick which transition is lost or you learn? Well, um, on cattail edges, I'm going to look at most of it, but I can look at a map and say, okay, where are their points coming off? Where are their fingers coming off? The tapering ground. What happens with that tapering ground is when you see them trees tapering down, it doesn't just stop at the marsh edge. 
usually it goes out a little ways in little high spots in our hand and it creates lots of bedding spots out of the water. You know what I'm saying? Yep. When you're on a flat edge, there's a lot less for those deer to, 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 to bet on. Now, if I thought there was something out here that's really huge, I'd probably walk every transition. But you could look at a map and say, okay, this area has a whole bunch of points and fingers. I want to see that. I want to see this area. So the, the big flat edges along the outside edge of the bowl or the outside mm -hmm. edge of a, a straight run of, of a woodlot, you're not too concerned about it until you get down from those tips. One thing I will say is if you get into an area that has too many figures, <laughs> it gets really hard to hunt a, uh, an individual buck because it could be in any one. The less you have, if you know a buck's in there, the better. Kind of like uh, more pressure helps you. Mm -hmm. But it's also not the kind of place you want to hunt where there's a lot of pressure, right? Because there's probably not a lot of bucks. But if there is a buck there and there's pressure, it puts those bucks where they belong. They're, they're going to be a little less likely to be haphazard about their bedding. They're going to put it more in precise spots. And that's why it helps you. Then. Correct. That's cool. Correct. Because it puts the deer where they belong. Cool. One thing I got a learning block on, how do I identify doe bedding? That's just food related? Uh, doe bedding, uh, I've never really concerned myself with it too much, except for like hunting downwind. Or not even necessarily downwind. Sometimes they seem to go upwind and they'll check where the does go in and out. But um, what you usually find is does bed up a little higher than the bucks, but the same general area. And they, they like to be on a higher ground, bed circular, watch for the danger, and have the swamp for like escape. Um, but you see them in all kinds of places, uh, a lot more than a lot more random. Yeah, and, and it's not really random, it's how they bet. Because they work as a group, they can monitor people better. Or not people, predators. If you look, here's one of them. You can see the hairs and stuff in the bed pretty easily. You can see the doe tracks. You can see where her shoulders were and her knee. And she was facing this way, watching for danger. If you look over there, Here's where this one was laying. Here's where her elbows were tucked in. And there's her doe track. And she's facing the opposite direction. Watch that opening. And then if you look over here, here's another doe bed. And here's where her elbows are right here. And she's facing out, looking out here. So they got this whole area covered. And uh, there's running tracks coming out of all these beds. So they were in here when I came in here. So here's bed number one, bed number two, bed number three. Bed, that one faces that way, that one faces that way, and this one faces this way. How many of you uh, looked at the maps of this area? A little bit. Uh, most of you. So, um, how many picked up this spot? Pretty obvious. But if you don't have the map and you don't even see it, you walk right past here and not notice that finger, but it sticks out on a map like crazy. Um, I've been hunting there for, for years and I've had some success there. Um, one of the things that stood out to me from the beginning was when I'd come up here, this spot right where we're standing, all these trees would just be ripped up with rubs on years when the oaks would drop, when these acorns were dropping which they didn't very well last year, which you see the rubs aren't opened up, right? So probably about every other year I walk up here and these rubs are open. But if you look around, you'll see there's historical ones everywhere mm -hmm. right here. This would be really rubbed up on years the acorns drop. So that told me that those bucks were bedding down there in early season, which was fairly accurate. I mean, we had some, some run-ins with some pretty good bucks down there in early season. But it wasn't until I ran a camera down there doing that bed study that I figured out I was wrong. Not wrong, but it was also a really good time during the rut. And they're not necessarily rubbing under the oak trees during the rut, so there wouldn't be sign up here. So even on years that there wasn't sign up here, that was still good during the rut. So um, two seasons ago, um, me and Rick ran a cell cam down there, and uh, we had uh, days where like 13 days, seven of them there was a buck bedded there that was a shooter in a row. Um, nice den point it was better there constantly and there's other big bucks and uh i hunted down there several times and had a lot of bucks go past me um during rut so it changed my whole philosophy just running the camera there one year for a season um 
the year before we put the cell cam there, somebody I know put a regular camera down there, and that regular camera, he didn't touch it the whole year. And there was a period of rut where, in rut where like uh, out of 14 days, there's only two days he wouldn't have hit, uh, shot a buck. And that's to say that the camera didn't pick him up. They might have been there and the camera didn't pick him up. But once you hunt it, I think you kind of, you make an interference there. But you start to learn there's certain time periods when spots are hot, you know what I mean? And this is one of them. It's kind of a unique point because this one, it tapers down into those cattails, but it drops off kind of immediately when it hits the, the water. There isn't any bedding past that point. Um, occasionally, I think they bed along the river or some high spots and still come up from there. Um, I think you walked in there, didn't you? Mm -hmm. So there's some bed on the From down there. The I didn't see a lot, but I only took, you know, one straight line path when we were driving, so. I think there's some beds in there, but not a lot. Most of them are right on the point. And when I've hunted in there, those deer get up right off the point. Um, but it's a really good point, and it's one of those areas that's got specific time frames. Pre-rut and early season. You know, the first week of the season and pre-rut. And I've never really seen a lot of pressure here. Occasionally, I'll see a guy down here. Uh, the other year, when me and Rick ran that camera for a whole season, one day I saw a guy walk in front of the camera. And it was a gun hunter just walking. And it looked like he looked at the camera and turned around and left. So that was the only, during the whole season, interaction we had with the person on it. But the, the season that we hunted, um, a kid hunted up here because of all the rubs and shot a doe here. You like that story, didn't you? Well, it's funny the way you explained it, that he went running all the way back to the vehicle with that thing on his shoulders to show his girlfriend. He did. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, he, he put the deer on his shoulder and literally from here ran all the way to the parking lot. Bow was standing and everything. But he was a young guy, probably like 17 or 16 or something. His girlfriend was, dropped him off and was picking him up. And he couldn't wait to show her this doe he shot. He had it on his shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it was his first deer or something it like was, that. Yeah. yeah, I stopped and talked to him, congratulated him. Yeah. And then in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, I hope he don't camp out there. <laughs> I never did see him again. So. But he shot the doe that was hot. Yeah. That was did. with your buck. That was the doe that was driving the buck. Because yeah. <laughs> that's what happened with the, the, that being such a good rut spot is there's does that bed here a lot later in the season, you know. So even on our camera, we were picking up uh, that doe group quite a bit. And then the rut buck showed up. So on my Onyx, I pinned that island out there, not this point coming off the main island. So what would make this better than out there? Or is Not there... a lot. They're both great. Okay. <laughs> 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 I can guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's basically what we're doing is hopping features, you know. Um, and I did notice a, a couple of times when I was out here, the bucks came from that island, you know, um, especially the younger ones that would get that far in daylight. Now, if you were to hunt your way into this, okay, great terrain feature, island out there, would you hunt your way out to there, unless there's um, something telling you to get straight out there? What I've done in the past is walk up here and see if the rubs are active. Okay. Um, but nowadays I'd probably just hunt it, but I don't have to, I don't have to hunt this first or second. Okay. I mean, uh, I can get into that island without boogering this. Matter of fact, people walk through here all the time, because when people come to an island like this, or any land body, they don't walk the way we did. They tend to follow the land features because they don't want to get lost. They walk in circles. So you'll see dog walkers and stuff walk along, around the rim of this island quite a bit. He was either bedding over there or over here pretty consistently, but staying in these cattails, not going to woodland where you can hunt them. And it was gun season. I had my buddy go in there after his hunt in the morning and he was going to kick that deer. If it was in there, he's going to walk that bedding area and then I was hoping it would show up over here. So he hunted it and then I came out here to hunt this and about halfway through here I fell through to my waist and it was below zero and uh, my pants froze. So I only lasted till like nine o'clock and then I had a, a deer come running in from his direction and bed underneath me a little fork horn. So I figured he did his drive, so I waited a little while longer and I got down and I went out and it took forever for him to come out and he said he didn't even do it till like 11 and I was already out of the woods. So then I came back in the evening to hunt here and I walked up to this tree and as I put my stand down the buck jumped up underneath that tree right there, that, that buck. And two days later, one of my neighbors in the inside of the swamp shot it. So because we kicked it around during gun season is why that happened. So you got to be careful with some of that bumpy stuff. I had one time I came in here and I hunted this tree and I had a really big buck jump up over there and run in here and I set up anyways and that buck came back at dark and he stopped right underneath this uh, buckthorn tree and I had the wind in my face like we do now but it was calmer 
and all of a sudden he snorted and blew back in there. I don't know if he just caught a back draft or what, but that was another close encounter. This brush loses its leaves in mid-October. So the fact that that was just completely full of rubs and, and, and beds, and knowing that a buck was not going to bed there in the blazing sun when those leaves were down, they just moved into the cattails. That told me that all those beds were being used in September. So that number of beds and that amount of sign in September told me that there's usually a buck there in September. And knowing the buck that was running around here, I really wanted to hunt it. So I followed the trail back straight to that point and set up over there. And then when I hunted this um, the first time, I was waiting for a north wind, and I was waiting for the opposite of what we have now. North wind going straight that way, and a brisk north wind. And the reason brisk is because I gotta make some noise in the cattails and the wet stuff. So first strong north wind we had was about five days of the season. I went around, got to that tree, and when I got set up, about a half an hour later, a doe, well fawn, got up 15 yards from me, bedded right beside me, stood up and started feeding. And then the mom stood up on the end of the point that said, and started feeding. And the mom started coming right underneath me. And while she's coming, I start hearing the cattails coming from this stuff. Couldn't see it, but you could hear it coming down the trail, slurping and walking through the cattails. And that doe's coming closer and closer to the buck coming, which I'm assuming is the buck, I can't see it. But she gets right underneath me, and I'm not very high up. And she looks over and sees a stick on the tree. I mean, that's her bedroom. She knows it's something different, right? She stares at it, and looks at the next one, looks at the next one, and looks at me and goes, Whoa! <laughs> Jumps out into the marsh for the fawn and runs around back to the point and just starts blowing, and blowing, oh, and blowing, and blowing. I won't that. stop. And uh, you just hear that buck just stop. And then finally she leaves. And but she blew like 20, 30 times. And uh, then I could hear the buck moving to the cat tails that way. So just to keep it honest, because that buck didn't know I was there, he just knew somebody was blowing. The next day I hunted it, nothing came, nothing showed up. Which was what I expected, but I had to try. And then I did something that most of you guys probably wouldn't do. I stayed the hell away from it. I didn't go back the whole rest of the year. Because I didn't want to have that continual scent there and that continual danger and have them know that that's a spot where people get the most danger. So I stayed out of it. Even though I wanted to hunt it, I knew better. The very next year, right in early September, same time frame, I waited for the very first time. I had a brisk north wind, which was five days into the season. I did the same trip, same trail, walked around setting the same tree. One major difference, those does didn't get up. There's no does around. And at the same time frame, the buck got up, walked down here, and underneath me and shot him. He's still right over there. I hit him a little far back. I either got liver or guts. It's a dead deer. It's just a matter of finding him. He didn't go but uh, 20 yards. I saw him right behind the bushes moving a couple minutes ago. 
I think I might have to leave that one overnight. That's a good boy! Good boy! Yeah, oh, wow. Check it out, Dan. Nice Holy job, buddy. cow, dude. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good job. All right. That thing is awesome. That thing is nice. Holy cow, that is awesome, dude. Yeah. Could have done it without you, Max. Good job, buddy. <laughs> Max is excited. Good job, Max. Some of it was tore up higher and broken off higher up, and there was a lot of it. And I knew that that buck was living on it. Right over here. So that, that's pretty interesting to me that you you didn't know what he was. You just knew he was mature, whatever he was. No, I, I pretty much knew the two bucks that were out here. Okay. There was two different bucks it could be. Okay. There was a very large 12-pointer and him. But I was pretty sure it was him because I hadn't seen the 12-pointer in over a year. And I was running cameras, so I'm thinking somebody might have winged that one, and I still haven't seen it, so I think it's just gone. Um, and you say you like running in early season. A lot of times when you do run cameras, you're running them where they accept cargo bands, human scent, human pressure. So you might have had over a walking trail. Or in, in this case, I had the camera. The only reason I bought this was for the wind. And every buck out here goes up on that island. It's getting really cold, that's why I ended up going with that. Now there's like five mm -hmm. cameras on it. <laughs> No, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think they all go to that island? Go betting or something? Or? I don't know. Uh, Those are the bucks? One of them deals, yeah. I, you know, it, it kind of, the best crops are over in that area. And it kind of, they got to go Cross. past it. And they tend to go to high land spots. Yeah, right. you, you know how we look for the lone tree for the bedding? I'll tell you what else I see. They seem that even when they ain't bedding underneath, it seems like all the trails go to them and spread out. But like you expect it to be bedding on a map because you see trails going to it. Right. It's almost like they use those as a beacon. Right. Like that's their travel because they're sitting in the cattails. All they can see is the sky. Right? right. And they seem to end up at those islands and like cross over. You can see the treetops or something. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Makes sense. That dogwood, that red stuff. There's some dogwood in there, but it's like, like willow brush mainly. Okay. But you can see the red tint. Mm -hmm. That's dogwood. So uh, let's take a look at the set. Right, right, right. Because if they're different, they don't feel like they can't push their way So Buck was bedded in this red brush. And then we were headed to where Dan's kill tree is. Which is right up on this point here. So that buck, uh, I could hear him all through there. I never seen him go across that dry land. So I could hear him all through there. And then I seen him when he popped out right here. And then he, he came through, walked right through here. And when he was right here is where I pulled the bowl back and he heard the click and he stopped. And uh, then he finally walked, he got right here. And this is where I shot him. Right here. And like I was saying before, look at where you see somebody came in here recently, cut all those branches on that tree. Oh, yeah. I didn't do that. Cut all these branches here. Sure you kind of blocked that trail. Rub the hell, man. Yeah, there's still bucks coming through here, but. Man. I, I'm thinking that the Small mature ones are probably avoiding them. Yeah, they're probably, probably going around in the cattails over there and around over here. And if you notice, when we're coming through the cattails, there's a couple new trails that jut off and go around. Yeah. So, let's take a look at the tree one. I think about 25 yards shot. Yeah, I'd say 20. Pretty young. And yeah. Pretty. Love seeing that one. Love seeing that one. Oh, yeah. I can miss the white and the gray in the woods, but I don't miss the woods. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We'll go right along with mm -hmm. here and found what we just looked at over there, that, that brush. And then backtrack it to here. Look for a setup. So much bigger here than on TV. On TV, that deer looks like it looks like you're right on top of him. Yeah. But and you are, but it just the wide angle is it looks like you're shooting more straight down. It's much different, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's cool to see it both ways. Mm -hmm. It is. I, th I think uh the whole perception of the video is, is hard to grasp. The betting, how close we are, all that stuff. Correct. I think uh, that's what makes this workshop kind of fun and cool. Yeah.
What's quite amazing when you actually think about it is how many years had you been hunting this marsh prior to killing this thing? Mm -hmm. And you you had just fallen that spot, I think it was three years ago you killed it, I right? I walked through there, but it never really dawned on me mm -hmm. until I was looking for something for that buck, some way to kill him. I walked up there and then I kind of noticed the dogwood and the brush mixed together and thought, hmm, and walked over there and looked mm -hmm. at it. And you're right, but I had been back here for years before I really that put that together. Yeah. That's what Barry said in his book. He walked by that one spot for 10 years. He said, I never knew it was there because yeah. I never walked in that direction. But yep. He found it. He said it was the best spot on the whole property to hunt it for 10 years. That's a good book. I, mean, I like that book. Very well done. Yeah. He got a sense of humor. Yeah, he does. Yeah. <laughs> you talk to him offline, it's crazy. One thing that Dan touched on right away at the beginning is being methodical and strategic with your setup. You find a spot that you can kill a giant buck, don't, don't ruin it by not having your system down once you finally get into that spot. You know, all that work that goes into it. Um, and everything from sawing a limb, not letting it fall to the floor, floor trying to find something to set it out onto. You know? um, downsizing to no backpacks, no fanny packs. If it doesn't fit in your pockets and your gear that you're already carrying on your body, you probably don't need it out there. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one because you, know, you got to do something with that backpack. Right. You got to leave it on the ground where you're going to see it, or you got to hang it in the tree, and it's another object. Look at those trees that are hung out of it, right? It's another thing, another thing taking up space. Yeah. You know, so that's that's huge to me. Uh, having your system down for your sticks, how they pack in, how, you know, we've got the trees coming through right now. You finally get to that spot in that tree that you're going to get in. There's time, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this, that you might be your second stick up and you're just sitting there waiting for that next gust of wind to come through to get that next stick set. You know, just trying to think of and say, what's going to cover any kind of potential sound you could create? And it's very satisfying getting up into a tree and almost laughing to yourself, like, I just got into this thing as quiet as I've ever got into a tree, you know? So, you know, that's a big part of what drives me, you, you know, um, because when you get to a point you grow, as I have, you get a lot of people to start reaching out to you saying, hey, want to come hunt my ranch? Hey, want to come do this? Want to do that? And I could easily go off on the route that most people do when they start getting well-known and hunting ranches and stuff like that and become unrelatable to everybody that's in my audience, right? But what drives me to keep doing it this way is there's something special about going on an equal playing field with everybody else and getting it done. To target a certain buck, and to set up in a tree, find that bedding spot you think he's bedding in, figure out how he's going through there, make a plan, and out of what do you think is out here, 10 million trees? Pick the one tree where you can kill that deer in daylight. And sit there and have that buck get out of that bed and walk you and kill it. There's a satisfaction there. There's a satisfaction of doing it quiet, of getting in there silently, figuring out a way to get in there, and you literally have to do everything right. You know, it's not a simple task. I also see the advantage today over a 40 year when you and I were kids, all you had was those big heavy steel, you know, mobile stands that weighed a ton, and they were loud. You couldn't get them into those. You couldn't get close like that. So with this lighter, the lighter stand, like the one you developed, it's going to be a whole different ball. When I was a kid, I, I can remember uh, when I really started getting into being mobile, I took like a, a, a solid steel stand, I think it was an API stand, and they didn't have straps, they had chains. I put holes over the chain and I, I electrical taped and duct taped every metal to metal contact. And I think it was like 30 pounds. And then I had uh, screw in steps that I taped every bit of it except for the thread. And then I put rubber bands around them in three places so that they wouldn't rattle in my pocket. And I used that to sneak into those areas. But I think a lot of people think that they have a little private farm or something that they haven't made and there's no pressure there. But really, there's the pressure. You know, so that spreading it out and getting on public land is good for you in two ways. Not only is it keeping the pressure off your land, but you don't grow as a hunter if you want the same stand in the world. You keep walking the same stand that you have preset on a public or a private piece or a lot or a funnel or whatever. You're not learning them. You're not growing as a hunter. What we're doing out here is we're growing constantly, constantly learning, constantly moving forward because you're doing something different every day, so you're seeing things different. You're seeing how deer react to things. You're seeing how you're relating one spot to another spot to another spot. And even when you get into even beyond that, like when I go travel to all these different states, you start comparing the different terrains and stuff, and you really become a well-rounded hunter. Stand placement, 
um, where you're showing us where to set up and stuff is probably the biggest takeaway I have just because five years ago, like you said, there's all there's oats all over the place, acorns all over the place over here. So I would just set up on an edge, didn't matter where it was, because they're coming out of the cattails to eat, but then you're shooting one year one and a half year olds, two and a half year olds, but you showing where where you're setting up and why, because that's where the mature deer, deer are, is completely different than I'm just some other guy sitting out here amongst a bunch of other guys instead of figuring out where the mature deer are, you know, being happy shooting a, a two and a half year old eight point because you don't realize that there's a, a five and a half year old 10 or 12 point somewhere else. So the stand placement and where you're walking and and seeing the wide angle instead of just watching your video, seeing where you were at, mm -hmm. is uh, it, that opens your eyes too. I see a lot of beginner hunters uh, that start getting into this. For whatever reason, they go out and they scout all these spots and they find them. They're all excited. And then they don't have them really pinned down. Make sure when you scout these spots, you find these bedding areas, that you, you do what we did on that point. You backtrack, find a tree, know where you want to be, think about what the deer can see, smell in here and pin down a spot and an axis to get in there because the time to do that is when you're going to go out there and hunt. So I didn't have anybody to teach me bad habits. At the same time frame when people were teaching you to sit on a bucket and stay there and eventually the deer will go by and stuff, I didn't learn that. I learned that every time I went out, I saw deer come out of the thick stuff, you know, and they, they weren't out by the field. The closer I got to the thick stuff, the more I saw them in daylight. So I, I learned from the deer. And to some degree, I think uh, not having mentors is a good thing that you don't come out of it with somebody teaching you their bad habits. Because I think a lot of the habits that have been passed down and a lot of magazine type habits aren't necessarily what's going to help you get here unless you have some million dollar land. When you're hunting public land, I think learn it on your own. But being a person who's a thinker, being able to evaluate something for yourself is the trade chain. That's really what it comes down to. I tell my I tell my buddies or my peers that I enjoy scouting because I enjoy looking for them or finding them where they're at, mm -hmm. and they don't understand that. Right, most people just want to hunt. My biggest takeaway, I think, is that I'm working the transitions on the wrong spot. I'm probably in the funnel, like where the deer is supposed to be coming. I need to be more concealed in the points, mm -hmm. uh, come on the other side of it, and then uh, go for it on day one. You know, uh, get all the way to the bedding area. Don't be afraid to push out deer. I think I have been too timid. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, uh, I think people are like, well, I only got one or two deer to hunt. But no, you don't. You get the whole public land, you got everything. You just keep moving. You've got to take those chances. I, I mean, when I look back at my wall, almost all the big ones are going for the gusto right away. Every time I sit back, it seems like once those deer know they're being hunted, it's so hard to kill. Especially if they're mature.